questions. Um, this is showing just mid-plane, um, and we have YE, or electron fraction on top, and electron degeneracy plotted in the lower panel here on the bottom. And what we found analyzing the simulations was as long as the accretion rate was high enough, the densities in the disk became high enough, that the electrons were driven to um, mild electron degeneracy. And this acted to suppress electron and positron pair creation, which of course went on to suppress positron capture. So meanwhile, we had <coughs> some, high, uh, some high energy electrons present in the disk, and those could be captured onto protons, driving the disk towards neutron-rich conditions. Um, and so, right, so that's how we get you know, the low IE that we need for the R process. Uh, the question, the second question has to do with how material is going to be injected from the disk. So um, in previous simulations, people had looked at unbinding material from the disk uh, through neutrinos. So the idea was you would have some neutrinos, material would uh, absorb those neutrinos, but also absorb their energy, and after enough subsequent neutrino absorptions, the material from the disk would eventually be liberated. So you know, the problem here is that by the time some neutron-rich material has absorbed that many neutrinos, um, the neutrinos overall favor protonization. So it's raised its YE, even if it was originally neutron-rich, it loses that in the process of becoming unbind, and the material that flies off the disk is, um, is not, oh, sorry, I also want to point out, this is, uh, this is the paper credit, so this is work that was actually led by my colleague Daniel Deagle, um, so I'm not let, <laughs> Let no one say that I don't credit my images. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, right. Sorry. Okay. But so, because we were doing a full 3D calculation um, that included MHD, we were able to resolve the Magneto rotational instability in the disk. And we found that actually the thing that unbound the material was not neutrino absorptions, but MRI turbulence. So this turbulence is so effective at removing material from the midplane that the material that was liberated from the midplane didn't really have time to suffer that many neutrino absorptions um, before you know, it made it out of the disk and started outflowing. So in this way, we were able to preserve, or I'm sorry, to create and preserve um, the low electron fraction that's required for a, a robust R process. All right, so returning to the full set of simulations, you know, we found that as long as accretion rates were high enough, so in this M1 and M2, we had the high densities that we needed to get the mild electron degeneracy, which is required to produce the low YE. Um, you know, in contrast, if you look at our third snapshot here, you see lower accretion rates meant lower densities. We didn't get the required conditions, um, and instead, you know, under those conditions, you um, get either kind of a lighter R process event or you get a different kind of nucleosynthesis altogether, burning either nickel 56 or um, you know, helium, or just burning alpha particles. Okay, so if you believe that collapse our disks could be capable of producing R process material, we can do some simple estimates to try to understand how important a source of R process material these events could be in the universe. Um, okay, so both from simulations and from our understanding of the progenitor systems, we estimate that collapsar disks should be much more massive than the disks that are formed in neutron star mergers. But um, since we think similar physical processes are at play in unbinding material, it stands to reason that they should both unbind a comparable fraction of the total disk mass. So if we combine this estimate along with observed <laughs> rates from short and long array <coughs> bursts, um, you know, we find that it looks like collapsars could at least be comparable to neutron star mergers as our process sources. And then an additional bonus when thinking about collapsars versus mergers is that because you know collapsars are core collapse supernovae, they track star formation, and so they can very naturally explain the presence of our process elements um, in the early universe. All right. Okay. But as I said, you know, in the first, as you saw from the first part of my talk, I'm more of like a radiation transport and um, transient. Uh, transient astronomy phenomenologist, so my interest is not just in studying this from a theoretical perspective, um, I'm also interested in knowing whether we can directly detect signs of the R processing collapsars just as we do for neutron star mergers. Um, okay, so one thing we might want to look at first is just, you know, we can think about total luminosity, right, and that's just reprocessed energy from radioactive decay. So we could argue that if we have a collapsar that has you know, some nickel 56 powering the light curve, and then we add um, an additional 
source of heat from our process decay, we might be able to see that, um, we may be able to see that extra energy in the light curve. Um, unfortunately, that turns out not to be a very great diagnostic. So this plot is just showing the radioactive power per gram that is produced by the R process versus um, combined nickel and cobalt 56 decay. So the dashed lines are the total um, energy generated, and then the solid lines are our estimate of thermalized energy, so the fraction of the radioactive energy that's converted into the photons that we see in our light curve. Okay, so these curves cross at about a day, um, and then nickel and cobalt heating becomes very, very dominant. Um, you can see it's quite dominant uh, around the time when the light curve peaks, which is when we could expect to get the best data. Um, and then it stays dominant out to several hundred days. So you know, this means that it would be very difficult from luminosity considerations alone to, to try to detect the presence of the R process. Um, okay, but fortunately, luminosity is not the only tool we have to work with. We can also think about colors and spectra. So I argued, you know, I spent the whole first part of my talk um, arguing that red and emission is a pretty strong signature of R process enrichment. So it makes sense to look at the spectra of GRB supernovae and ask whether they show signs of, of this reddened emission. So we are you know, lucky in that we have already a couple decades of data of GRB supernovae that we can look at. So this is showing actually the time evolution of the spectrum of supernova 1998 EW, which was the first supernova that was associated with a, a long gamma ray burst. Um, I apologize because the lines are a little thin and it's a little hard to see exactly what the spectral shape is. But you don't really need to see the spectra in detail. You can kind of get all the information you need just by looking at the axes, right? Um, so, kind of based on the you know the overall shape of the spectra that we see here, we can conclude it's pretty unlikely that 1998 EW is harboring some infrared component, you know, way out here. Um, okay, and so what this means is that any model that we come up with for an R process enriched class R. Uh, you know, consistent with our theoretical results, also has to be consistent with the observations that we already have of GRB supernovae. Um, okay, so I apologize for how hokey this upcoming animation is, but I wanted to show off my keynote skills. So, um, <laughs> right, one idea that we had for, for hiding the R process is to bury it inside the bulk of the supernova ejecta, right? So this is kind of physically motivated if you assume that something happens to launch the supernova, and then the disk outflow, you know, containing the R process rich material is, is launched at some time delay. And we'll call this the unmixed model. Um, because we want to look at the full range of possibilities though, we also considered a maximally mixed model where, you know, the, the supernova and the R process outflow kind of happen at the same time and, and something happens such that the R process material is fully mixed into the supernova ejecta. Um, okay, so and then you know, I use radiation transport calculations, my uh, tool of choice, to try to understand what the supernova light curves and spectra would look like in each of these scenarios. So again, I apologize, this is kind of a, a busy plot. Um, we have bolometric luminosity here, a select broadband light curves here, and the time evolution of the spectra for the mixed and unmixed model. Um, okay, but the story, kind of you know, contained in all of these plots, is just that as long as the R process material is kind of segregated um, interior to the bulk of the supernova ejecta, it's reasonably easy to hide its effects. Um, and we can produce something that looks more or less like a typical GRB supernova. Like a big caveat here is that um, GRB supernovae are in general mysterious, and it's not easy to use radiation transport simulations uh, even without the additional complication of the R process to, to reproduce their light curves and spectrum. But we get something you know, that at least looks passable, um, I think, by the, the current standards of the field. But if we mix the R process out, uh, things start to look weird, right? We get a plateau-y light curve that definitely does not demonstrate the short, bright peaks that are characteristic of GRB supernovae. We shift our emission into the infrared, um, and the spectra start to look very weird, right? You can see in the mixed case, which are these lighter, more pastel lines relative to the bolder lines that represent the unmixed model, uh, we actually start to corrupt the spectrum uh, at peak and even before peak. So I think these models suggest that if the R process is present in these supernovae, 
And if they explode in such a way that the R process material becomes fully mixed into the ejecta, we probably would have noticed that by now. Um, okay, so that explanation helps us in one regard because it tells us here's a way that we can hide the signs of the R process um, in a way that's consistent with observations. But you know that's only one half of the goal because what we really want to do is find a way to you know discover signs of the R process, not just argue that it should never be seen. So. The question we have to answer now is, how are we going to go out and look for signs that the R process is present in some of these explosions? One idea is to wait until very late times, right? If you remember, I showed that heating curve and argued that nickel is dominant um, over time scales of interest. But if we wait a really, really long time, those curves cross again. And what that tells us is that if we uh, you know, delay until very late times, eventually most of the photons that are forming the light curve are going to have been filtered through high opacity material, and um, you know they should. The, I guess the resulting spectrum should reflect that history of traversing our process material. Um, okay, so of course a problem with waiting a very long time is that supernovae get dimmer the longer you wait, and they get harder and harder to observe. But luckily, just under a year and a half ago, um, kind of the nearest GRB supernova ever detected was seen. And it's now reached a stage where we can think about starting to look for signs of the R process. So we were very lucky to be working with Yamatin Selsing, who is currently um, based at Copenhagen. And um, I guess he was the, the PI on an X shooter proposal to actually take late time spectra of this GRB supernova, and it was accepted. So we have actually taken the data now, and I believe he's in the process of reducing it. Um, but so we're very excited you know, to see what these late time 